This video is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com and GatheringMagic.com, your place to explore the game. Hi, my name is Maximilian Schrader. I'm a level two judge from Kansas City, and this is my Sedisi Brood Tyrant Commander deck. So when Sidisi Brew Tyrant was spoiled for a Kanza Tarkir, I, like many other people, probably misread that second trigger and thought it said whenever a creature card was put into your graveyard, instead of whenever one or more creature cards is put into it. That would have been much better, obviously, and probably would have been overpowered. But nonetheless, I fell in love with the card when I first saw it and decided that I was going to make this my, uh, my pet project for Commander. I was going to try and make the coolest Sidisi deck possible. So I've been working on foiling it out, and obviously there's still some gaps in here. I'm waiting for opportune times to pick up cards. But so far I've gotten the majority of the way through it, and it's been a lot of fun building the deck. I've been trying to keep powerful cards in the deck because obviously I want to play powerful cards and I'm playing Commander. But I'd also like to include some cards in here that are probably not necessarily optimal, since more than anything I like to play Commander to have fun. I just want to try and do something cool in the games that I play. If I win, sweet, it's icing on the cake. But if I don't, it's no great shakes. So you'll see some cards in here thinking like, why is he playing that card? And you'll probably notice that I'm not playing some cards in here and you're probably thinking, is he crazy? Why is he not playing card X? Well, the reason is I like to try new things out from time to time. And I want to try and at least have some of my like pet choices here in this deck. So you'll notice that this isn't, I guess, the most optimal deck that you could play, but it's still a ton of fun and I enjoy it thoroughly. This is just my personal touch on a commander deck. So, Sidisi in black, blue, and green is going to have some really sweet stuff to do. And we're going to have to have a lot of mana fixing since we're in a tricolor deck. So, the mana base is fairly obvious. We're going to start with the three OG duels that are in our colors, or original gangster duel lands. Uh, the three shock lands. And then we have the three fetch lands in our colors. Followed by the three buddy lands, or whatever it is you want to call these things. I never really figured out what they were supposed to be called. In the uh, from the core set and in a strad blocks, and then we have the Shadowmore filter lands, the bounce lands or Karoos from the original Ravnica block. Then we have some three color lands in Command Tower, Reflecting Pool, and Opulent Palace, and the rest of the lands in this deck are some monocolor or colorless utility lands. The first three are the Onslaught Cycling lands. And then we have Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth, for obvious reasons. Dryad Arbor, because it synergizes with Sidisi, so when you mill Dryad Arbor, you get a dude. And it is also nice to get back for Life in the Loam. A Cephalid Coliseum, because combined with Life in the Loam, will draw you a billion cards. Reliquary Tower, because Commander is a format where you draw tons of cards and you need somewhere to put them. Now granted, since we're a graveyard deck, we don't necessarily care that we're going to discard these cards, but I would much rather keep them in my hand. Strip Mine to deal with people's broken land effects. Speaking of broken land effects, Valra's Stronghold lets you regrow creatures. Vosayaju is the land you use to force through your spell that you need to win the game. An Alchemist Le Refuge lets you do some really broken things when combined with Seaboard Muse or Prophet of Crufix. And then I have my basic lands, uh, just a couple, which are essentially my concession to cards like Path to Exile. I have a Swamp, two Forests, and an island. Now for the spells. The first spell is Entomb, which for all intents and purposes in a graveyard deck is a demonic tutor. More often than not, if I have this in my opening hand, I'm gonna go get Life from the Loam, which is the next spell in this deck. Life from the Loam is an excellent card because it allows you to consistently hit land drops. It fuels our graveyard, which is what we want in a commander deck. And it's really, really easy to set up an insanely powerful advantage engine with just another card like a Cycling Land or a Cephalid Coliseum. You can just generate a ton of card advantage for very little investment on your part. Demonic Tutor, duh. Grizzly Salvage, because it fills up my graveyard and it helps me either do one of two things. In the early game, it's probably going to be used to hit an early land drop or find a color fix that I need for what lands I have in play right now. In the late game, it's find that powerful creature that I need to either establish some board presence or put me over the top of my opponents and win the game. Maelstrom Pulse is the best removal spell in black-green. 
hits Planeswalkers, and conveniently hoses token strategies. Crows and Grip is a concession to artifacts and enchantments, because in Commander, people will play the most broken artifacts and enchantments they can find. This is the best way to ensure they die. Damnation, because even though I have a creature-based deck, sometimes my opponents will get ahead of me with their board presence, and sometimes I'll just need to reset the board. Doing it for four mana seems like the best solution. Factor Fiction is awesome, because in a graveyard deck, the rest of the cards that you get from Factor Fiction, rather than going to your hand, go to the graveyard, so this might as well be a draw five every time. Sever the Bloodline is awesome, since it exiles creatures, and the fact that you can flash it back means you can dredge this card uh, without any second thought. Dread Return works in kind of the same way, especially since most of the time when you get late in the game, people aren't going to be paying that close of attention to your graveyard, so you can just flash back Dread Return and blow people out and usually just win the game without them realizing what happened. Gerard's Ardors is one of the weaker cards in the deck. It is nice in that it gives you synergy with your commander because the creature that goes to your graveyard goes there directly from your library, so it will trigger Sadisi. Um... But more than anything, it's just a double demonic tutor for creatures in a graveyard deck. I thought it was cool, so I'm playing it. Bribery is essentially the blue spell that you have to play in Commander, because everyone's going to be packing some stupid creature, and everyone's going to be packing bribery to get other people's stupid creatures. Living Death is primarily how I win most of my games. Usually you're going to do it for somewhere between 12 and 20 creatures, depending on how far you are in the game, and it's almost always enough to just put the game out of its misery in one fell swoop. Beacon of Unrest is a utility card that I use primarily because I can shuffle it back into my deck. So I can use it over and over again, but what most people don't realize about this card is that it can target artifacts in addition to creatures and it hits any graveyard. So you can just add to your board something really awesome from any player, including yourself, and it's a ton of value on a five mana card. Increasing Ambition, while a very expensive Demonic Tutor, is nice to be able to just tuck it in your graveyard and save it for later, because you'll be grateful when you had that 8-mana uh, spell in your graveyard to Demonic Tutor for those two cards you needed to either win the game or keep yourself alive. Spitting Image is an awesome card, because with Life from the Loam, it's very easy to get Retrace online, at least on a consistent basis, and when you have a ton of mana, you can just start pumping out clones of whatever the best creature is on the board. So it's just awesome to chuck it in your graveyard and forget about it until you need it. Villainous Wealth is more of a funsies card, since this is just... It's a three-colored card that's playable, which you don't get too many of in black, blue, and green. So if you're going to be home, why the not? I'll play it. Plus, it's always fun to hear, like, you know, I won that Commander game when I cast Villainous Wealth for 20 and then did all of these things. It's a really fun card. Uh, it'll probably end the game on the spot. I can't imagine a game in which you cast this for 15 or more and not win the game. But this is more or less a pile of fun that I decided to throw in the deck. I've got a couple of artifacts, none of which are terribly critical. But they're fairly obvious, and most of them generate mana. Um, Soul Ring, because you basically get the double time walk. Uh, Skull Clamp, because your dudes are going to die a lot, and drawing cards when your creatures die is pretty good. Mesmeric Orb is the card that turns the DC into what you always wanted her to be. Because every mill from Mesmeric Orb is a separate trigger, it causes a separate instance of Sadisi's second ability to trigger. So on the normal scenario, when you cast Sadisi from the command zone, if you hit three dudes, you're only getting one zombie. But let's say you untap 11 permanents and hit 11 creatures, you are actually getting 11 zombies. So you can use this as a way to kill people with your commander. Alternatively, in the late game, when people are untapping 20, 30 permanents at a time, this can just be a way to mill people out of the game because they will just run out of cards very quickly. Coalition Relic is excellent mana fixing and it ramps me from 4 to 6 and 5 to 7. Chromatic Lantern makes sure that I have all the colors I need available and it adds in more mana. And Mimic Vat, just in a creature based deck on its own, is good enough to play it. But the fact that you can also take your opponent's creatures when they hit the graveyard can keep them off of whatever their reanimator strategy is if they're playing a reanimator deck, or you can take their super powerful hoser or must answer threat like Consecrated Sphinx and just keep pumping them out every turn. Really, really good. Now for the enchantments. Um, believe it or not, I actually didn't know Phyrexian Reclamation existed until when I was putting this initial list together. I asked a friend of mine if he would look over this and see if there you know, was any glaring things I should be playing. He you know, was like, why aren't you playing Phyrexian Reclamation? So I looked at the card and realized, okay, this is probably pretty good. I'll give it a shot. 
But in practice, it's it's arguably been the best enchantment in my deck. It's probably my new favorite. The fact that you can regrow creatures at instant speed can make for some really insane plays, especially when some of your creatures have counter spells attached to them and they can be played at, at instant speed. So if you're playing any number of creatures and your deck is playing black, you should be playing Phyrexian Reclamation. Survival of the fittest because, you know, we're playing a creature deck. Phyrexian Arena is also pretty self-explanatory. I want to draw more than one card a turn. Rites of Flourishing is one of my primary pieces for ramping because I don't play a lot of spell-based ramp like Sky Shroud Claim where the lands just enter the battlefield at the cost of a card. Um, I'm very permanent-oriented in this deck, so I need to make sure that I have ways to ramp that are either on creatures or enchantments, and this is an easy way to do it. The fact that I get to draw an extra card as well a turn is icing on the cake. Pernicious Deed is one of my sweepers in this deck. Uh, I'm sad that it doesn't hit Planeswalkers because Planeswalkers didn't exist when this card was first printed. A little, little disappointing, but, you know, it takes care of everything else, so it's still definitely good enough to play it. Necromancy, in my opinion, is the best reanimation spell in the game uh, for a few reasons. One, it can hit every graveyard like the classic animate dead effects can, but the primary thing is that you can cast it at instant speed, which creates a lot of potential for blowouts. Uh, you can grab a creature from your graveyard with a counter spell attached to it to counter some opponent's critical spell. You can grab their dude, like, say, Woodfall Primus, to blow up their permanent when they least expect it. Or you can just cast it at sorcery speed to get some insane value. Um, when I played Child of Alara, I used to just surprise blow up the board by casting this in the end step. And then grabbing back Child of Alara, and when Necromancy died from the, uh, the clause where you have to sacrifice it at the end of the turn... Uh, Child of Alara kind of blew up the board. So this is a really sweet card. It's a lot of utility and a lot of raw power for three mana. Mana Reflection is good for obvious reasons, um, but the fact that we're playing so many Karoos and Filter Lands means that we can abuse what this card does. So the Filter Lands uh, turn one mana into four, the Karoos tap for four. If for some reason you can copy this, like say with Clever Impersonator, uh, then things just get way out of hand and the sky's the limit. Deadbridge Chant is a fun card for me. I like the fact that I can instantly throw 10 cards in my graveyard. It starts my graveyard thing going. And then it also acts as like a mini Phyrexian Arena where I'm drawing it, I'm drawing at least an extra card a turn. Uh, best case scenario, I hit a dude and it enters the battlefield. And since a third of my deck roughly is creatures, you can get some pretty sweet value out of Deadbridge Chant. Now for the most important part, you got the creatures. Snapcaster Mage is obvious. If you're playing blue, you got to be playing Snapcaster Mage. This card just does everything you want it to do. Rift Sleeper is a concession to Graveyard Hate because you will see Graveyard Hate in Commander. The Graveyard is an insanely powerful resource and people know to tech against it. But it also gives you a way to get cards back that say you flashed back and wanted to reuse again, like your Sever the Bloodline. Uh, you will always, almost always find a way to make use of this card in one way or another. Because it seems like such a narrow ability on the surface, but in reality, Whiff Sleeper actually provides a lot of value for the deck. Eternal Witness is Eternal Witness. Wood Elves is some of this, um, the permanent-based ramp I've been talking about. It's on a dude, which is really helpful, and the fact that it doesn't uh, restrict itself to basic force allows me to fix my mana in a pinch. Azusa Lost But Seeking is more creature-based ramp, and while it's not as good as commander decks that are specifically built around Azusa, like the mono green ramp decks, uh, you can very easily turn her on, so to speak, when you have life from the loan going and just play three lands a turn on a consistent basis. Oracle of Moldiah is much the same thing. Easy way to play extra land. Clever Impersonator, as mentioned before, is the best clone in the game. Not even close. Phyrexian Metamorph, I would argue, is the second best clone in the game. Mystic Snake is one of my counterspell creatures. The fact that it's a snake is awesome, since we get the little uh, snake Sidisi thing going here. Uh, but you can do so many things with creatures that you can pull out of your graveyard at instant speed, whether that's with Phyrexian Reclamation or Necromancy. Uh, so this is actually, surprisingly, one of the better creatures in the deck. Venser is much the same thing, except instead of countering, he either remands or bounces permanence. Either way, still an insane card. Karo Spell Snatcher is not as good as some of the other creature counter magic, but the great thing about Karo Spell Snatcher is that most people don't know to expect it yet. At least in my experience, when people see a blue deck morphing a creature, they're going to expect that it's either a Willbender or a Vesuvian Shapeshifter. Uh, Karo Spell Snatcher hasn't quite penetrated the EDH meta, so to speak, quite as much as the other two cards, 
And they are usually quite surprised when they find a spell jack that's being turned face up. Seedborn Muse is broken. Prophet of Crufix is even more broken. Body Double is the ideal clone for a creature based deck or graveyard based deck because you're always going to have a dude in the graveyard to copy whether or not your opponents have something to copy is beside the point. Mold Drifter is the, the value. I mean, Mold Drifter is just taking a trip to Value Town every time you play that card. Sidisi Undead Vizier, because, you know, we're playing a Sidisi deck, we have to play every Sidisi, right? And, I mean, there's a Demonic Tutor attached to this one. Why would you not play this card? Puppeteer Click is awesome. Uh, the fact that it reanimates cards from an opponent's graveyard is really cool. The fact that it exiles them when you're done is even better. The fact that it persists just puts it over the top. Consecrated Sphinx is the necessity uh, when you're playing blue. It's the, the necessary evil in blue creatures. I I don't think this card's very fun to play with for a, a few reasons. Uh, it's one of those cards where you play it, your opponents have to answer it. And if they do answer it immediately, then you just got no value out of six mana. Or But if they don't, then it generally escalates its advantage out of, out of hand so quickly that you will just win the game. And there's nothing your opponents can do about it. So in that regard, it's it's a little unfun, but I feel like it's still unnecessary evil. Because if I'm playing blue, I gotta have some way of making sure that I absorb their removal so I can get my other threats in. And Dead Eye Navigator is much the same way. If you leave this card unchecked for any significant amount of time, whether that's a turn or two turns, um, and you pair this with some ETB like Mold Drifter, even the most seemingly innocent enter the battlefield ability will just grind so much advantage away from your opponents that they can't possibly come back. Progenitor Mimic, another clone, imagine that, is an awesome clone because it copies itself every turn. So you get a sweet ETB copy on Progenitor Mimic and you're just going to value town. Draining Welk is my other hard counter creature in this deck, but this one I prefer to sandbag to the late game when people like to use their X spells like Exsanguinate and Blue Sun Zenith. Because then suddenly for six mana, not only are you countering your spell, or their spell, you're dropping a 20-something, 20 20-something 20 on the battlefield that flies. So now a seemingly innocent counterspell has turned into something they have to kill or they are going to lose the game. Duplicate is the best creature removal in the game. It exiles dudes. The fact that it's an artifact and a creature makes it very easily recurrable. Should be in every commander deck ever. Soul of Innistrad is fantastic not so much because of its first ability which you can do on the battlefield because i very rarely ever actually just have this sitting on the battlefield where i can activate it over and over again to regrow three creature cards uh, the fact that you can exile it from the graveyard after you've dredged it is what makes it so useful and in a pinch this has actually saved me uh, more often than not with the, this next card hythonia the cruel i don't see a lot of people playing hythonia the cruel but i think she's got a lot of utility for what she does I, I consider it a pet pick mostly because, you know, it's Snake Lady. Sidisi's a Snake Lady. Haha, <laughs> we get it. But the monstrosity ability is definitely impactful. And there have been a couple of games where I've used Soul of Innistrad to regrow her at the end of someone's turn, untapped, cast and monstrous Tythonia the Cruel in the same turn to wipe the rest of the board. Because realistically, Gorgons are probably not going to be a part of the creatures on the board. I suppose someone could have a random changeling out there that survives, but for the most part, this is essentially going to be a Reaver Demon on a stick whenever you activate that monstrous ability. So it's a very solid card. Rune Scarred Demon, having a detutor on an ETB is very, very good. Not much else needs to be said about that. His younger cousin, Sphinx of Uthun, Factor Fiction Sphinx, if you want to call him that, while not quite as good as the Runescard Demon, is still more than good enough to play in this deck. Shieldred Whispering Run is more so for the early game advantage for when you happen to get a sweet early reanimator spell. Uh, because when you drop her early in the game, it puts a lot of pressure on your opponents with the constant attrition that she has against their board presence. And usually you're having some way to dredge cards in your graveyard to make sure that you're getting a dude at the beginning of every one of your upkeeps. So that can either run the game out of hand very quickly and win you the game, or it can eat up enough of their removal and or answer cards that you can do whatever else you want to do later. The Primordials, since, especially since I play multiplayer commander more often than not, are exceptionally powerful. And I'm kind of sad that I don't have the green commander anymore, or the green primordial anymore to play in this deck. 
but Sepulchral Primordial is very solid. Getting a dude out of everyone's graveyard, making it what usually amounts to a four for one, can accelerate your board presence so much to catch up from any situation or put you far enough ahead that your opponents are suddenly having to deal with whatever it is you're doing. Sometimes it's enough to win you the game on the spot. And then Diluvian Primordial is in much the same vein, except it hits spells. And I would think that it's actually even more powerful than the Sepulchral Primordial because the spells tend to be more powerful than the creatures themselves in Commander. And if someone happens to be foolish enough to leave a time stretch in their graveyard, they're going to be in for a world of hurt. Trastodon deals with those pesky non-creature permanents, i.e. planeswalkers, and gives them 3-3-3 elephants. And usually you generate enough creatures, whether through Sidisi or your constant reanimation effects, because you only play like 31 creatures in this deck, that the 3-3s three you give them really doesn't matter for board presence. Plus you have enough ways to wipe the board that even if their board presence is better than yours, you can take care of it in a flash. Woodfall Primus, much like Terastodon, is there to police the board, but he does so with Persists, which makes him even more valuable. The fact that he has Trample as well also makes him no slouch in combat. And then finally, I have Ulamog, my token Eldrazi. Uh, the fact that you can Vindicate a permanent when you cast him is pretty sweet. The fact that he's indestructible is also really cool. But more than anything, he's also there to make sure that I don't mill myself out of cards. And it can generate a couple of non-bows when you have a Life in the Loam engine going on, but usually you have enough tutor effects to where you can reset that without too much trouble. If you're on the Mesmeric Orb game plan, this is a great way to ensure that you are going to be the only one who's not dying at the table. Thanks for watching CMDR Decks. Don't forget to subscribe and favorite.